Let's do this today. Let's pray um, to the Blessed Virgin Mary for, for her um, guidance as we um, listen to what I have to say today, but more importantly, what the Spirit has to say about what I'm saying. So as you all listen, the Spirit applies a meaning to my message, okay? So let's implore her to, to guide us this morning. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to hand out something to you this morning. This is just a nice little list of about 25 things on each page, so about 50 or so things of things that I kind of use for books or DVDs. And so when you're looking for something to read, this is kind of like my, list, my reading list or my or a DVD series kind of list. And um, that way you'll have something just to well, in case you're looking for something. Take one. Yeah, I got plenty. Yeah. OK. So I'll be, I'll be referring to this a bit. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be jumping around because I'm going this kind of topic group, okay? You and sent us a list about two years ago. Yeah, and it's, just got, it's gotten long longer. Long it's gotten longer. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible to get an electronic copy of it. Yes, yeah. In fact, uh, Gene, if yeah. you can remember, just send, send me a little email. Okay. Deacon Dave, you did such a wonderful presentation. And by the way, remember to send your electronic file. How's that? <laughs> I'll use those exact words. <laughs> uh, it's recorded. Yeah. So, so today, really, I mean, the title of the, of the talk, so to speak, is like what the, the, the best Christian authors have to offer us. But really, in a, in a sense, it's going to uh, be talking a little bit about my own personal journey, you know, because like many of you, uh, for many, many, many years, you know, I've was a good, faithful, mass-going Catholic who didn't read the Bible, <laughs> who didn't study scripture, <laughs> didn't go to classes, just kind of did what Catholics typically do. And so uh, Monsignor L came along uh, in 1997 to uh, Sacred Heart and started offering faith formation classes. And I began to go to them, and I realized there was this whole world that I didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. And for me, it sort of started with Thomas Merton. So, uh, You'll see a book on the uh, first page. If you go down about the middle of the page, you'll see New Seeds of Contemplation. Um, and two below that, An Invitation to the Temple of Life. And so um, he began you know, sharing um, Thomas Merton with us, who is a monk, who is um, uh, a priest and a Cistercian, a Trappist monk, okay, in Kentucky. And uh, many of you know of Thomas Merton, but uh, he was a prolific writer, and uh, and so I was, um, you know, in, in one of these classes one day, and certain things just kind of hit you. And this is where I'm going to talk about the kind of things that I think are the best things they have to offer. And so for Thomas Merton, this was a moment for me, and it was in the book New Seas of Contemplation, where he wrote, "For me to be a saint means to be myself. For me to be a saint means to be myself." Now, my sister from Arizona happened to be in a class with me that day. <laughs> And when I said those words, she started laughing because she knew the little brat David, the little brother, you know. She's about 15 years older than me, so she watched me grow up, you know. And so she said, okay, sure, buddy. I mean, to say this to myself. But what that told me was that I didn't have to be somebody else. And that was a big moment because most of us sort of look at a, a saint and we're so overwhelmed by their holiness that we say, well, I can't be like St. Teresa of Calcutta, or I can't be St. John Paul II, mm -hmm. or I can't be. And we, and we sort of think saints are for the saintly, and I'm not, you know? And when I read that line, I went, wait a minute. It isn't about being somebody else. It's about being who God created and called me to be, which is going to be different than everyone else. And that was like, I got a path, you know? I don't have to be someone I can't be, because I really can't be them. I can be myself. And then he goes on the next line to say, so then the problem of sanctity and salvation, so this is holiness, sanctity, okay, and salvation, eternal life, is in fact the problem then of finding out who I am and discovering my true self. Finding that true self. And what I found with that true self, as he writes further in the book, is this true self 
is not to build up my potential, so to speak, as a human being, but instead to actually lose myself and to allow Christ to rise up within me, right? To allow Christ to live through me. So that line that's also in the book from St. Paul that says, there's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, just sort of was the answer. You know, I gotta let go of my ambitions and say, I've got to be my true self, but the true self is a self I find in Christ, not a self I find out of the world. Empty myself with the worldly thing and fill myself up with Christ. And so that, just those few lines in this book, and it's a wonderful book and it has a lot more than that, but, but that kind of began the journey. Another book that's uh, two down called uh, An Imitation of the Contemplative Life is a book that's themed. So this book's different. It's not just one book. It's takes the best of Merton, so to speak, and puts it into themed topics, <coughs> like freedom and the contemplative life and all sorts of different things. And so in this book, you don't have to read a um, whole book to get the best of it. You kind of read paragraphs, you know, here's and there. But they're all themed by something. So just as an example, in, um, in, in the section on freedom, um, it made me realize, again, when we talk about this, this true self, the self you're called to be, that the old self, the false self, has to die. And again, he writes, to be born again then is not to become somebody else, but to become ourselves, the true selves we're called to be, to become a new creation in Christ. Okay? So again, more things like that from a book like that. Okay? So um, what I started to realize was, gee, I, this isn't really so much about um, learning things, like it would be if I was taking other classes. I realized it was not about kind of information or formation, and so I started to have these changes in my heart. You know, like my real identity, my person, was beginning to change, okay? And that wasn't what I was expecting. I thought when I'd go to a class, I would be learning knowledge, you know, like I'd be taking a class in Latin or something, so I'd learn the subject matter of Latin. Well, what this was so different was I started to ask, who am I? You know, who is this true self? That is somewhere in there, but I don't know who he is. You know, who, who did God really call me to be? And so Matthew Kelly put some other things on top of it when he started talking about the best version of yourself, another way of saying the true self, right? Moving away from sort of my false self, from maybe the mask I sort of wear, but to really dig down deep and say, who am I really? Matthew Kelly says it like this: Who am I? Right? Why am I here? What am I here for? What matters most, what matters least, you know? And he calls it clarity. I mean, we, get to, we get to clarity about our identity. Wow. You know? And then what was so great was when he said, and you know what, if you have clarity about who you are, you get to say no to the things that matter least. I went, like, yes! Because <laughs> I have to say no a lot. Right? Because people are always asking you, do this, do this, can you help with this, can you sign up for this, can you be on this, can you do that thing? And I started to realize, i got to see, who, who am I supposed to be and what am I supposed to do? But also, what matters least, what am I not supposed to be involved, right? So that was a moment. So those two together kind of helped me to understand that the spiritual life really is about identity. And, and when living out that life in Christ, okay? So, um, so that's a little bit about Merton. So next I'm going to go into um, the Trinity a little bit. Because that's what we're really called to, right? It's not just a life of Christ, it's a life of the whole Trinity, right? The Father, Son, and Spirit. So one of the books that um, I think does a great job of that is a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And some of you are familiar with this one. But one thing that he does really well is, is he helps us to kind of understand um, what, our, what our big purpose is. And he says it like this. He says, um, Christ came to the world and became man in order to spread to other men the kind of life he has by what I call good infection. Okay? And Christ is trying to share his good infection with us, his life. And here's the big lines. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. When you read those lines, you sort of sit there and go, boy, now that boils it down. That's a one line. It's like, you know, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, it's like that kind of moment. The whole purpose of be becoming Christian is to become a little Christ, to become Christ to, to each other, right? And so this is a wonderful book that kind of helps us understand God's plan for humanity. It starts with the natural law and how we um, have natural law 
and within us already, but then how we are to grow beyond that and to enter into this Trinitarian life. And so um, he, uh, he just has great examples throughout the whole book, and I've used them before in class, I won't use them more, but, but this is a book that kind of really helps you understand who is this God who wants to share his Trinitarian life with me and allow me to live, live through that. So that's the last one. Another book that does a great job on the Trinity, many of you know, is The Shack. And The Shack did something different than mere Christianity. The Shack kind of put characters, an African-American woman for the Father, and Jesus, of course, is the Jewish person, and then the Spirit is a kind of Asian-looking uh, woman, in, in the flesh, right? And, and had these conversations with this poor guy who loses his young daughter, uh, to a murderer uh, whose young daughter's abducted and murdered. And in this book, there's these great conversations between the main character and God. And it's almost always like if you ever had an opportunity to say, God, why do you permit evil? God, why did you, you know, uh, send your son to die for us? Why did this have to happen to my daughter? Um, why this, why that? And it, it answers these great questions, you know, as best it can in this novel. And so it really gives you insight in a very personal way into the Trinity. And for those of you who haven't read the book, maybe you've seen the movie, but you kind of get the idea that it kind of said, this is kind of like a, a portrayal, like a parable, if you want to call it, of the Trinity. And gives us a way to kind of understand better how we can enter into this life with the three persons of the Trinity. So that's a book like this. And that in the Shack book is, let's see, it's on the uh, uh, top of the second page, about five or six down there. Um, so that's just a couple on the Trinity. Okay. Now let's get into the liturgy a little bit, because here's where we get, you know, our, our, our central, right, the Catholic. So central to us is the Mass, right? And within the Mass we have two liturgies. We have the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. So I'm going to kind of do it that way. And so for the Word, um, you can kind of look at different things and say, well, what's, the, what's a great way to really kind of understand Scripture? And a great place to start and then move on from there is uh, Jeff Cavins when he has his uh, real simple... Uh, eight Weeks Unlocking the Mystery of the Bible. And what this did so well, for those of you who have done it or, or are familiar with it, is he does what he calls the Bible timeline. And he, he does a great job of kind of saying, you know, from Genesis all the way through, you know, to the time of the church, I'm going to narrow this thing down to 14 narrative books, and I'm going to explain to you the Bible in four hours. <laughs> People start reading the Bible in Genesis, and by the time they get to Leviticus, they're pooped. Mm -hmm. This is a better way, trust me, okay? Mm -hmm. He calls it a helicopter ride over the Bible, okay? <laughs> now, he has other series that go much more detail, you know, 23 weeks at 50 minutes apiece, that go, let's say, maybe 5,000 feet from the surface, not 10. But this is a great way of really getting the bigger picture. And for a lot of us, and including me, I work better on a more elementary level. The more detail I get, the less I remember. So he does this on a helicopter ride, and I kind of get it. You know, I remember the big dates. <laughs> Okay, Abraham, Moses, David, you know, and you kind of, okay, it's about this long, this period. Here's when the, you know, the deportations to Assyria are. Here's the Babylonian exile, you know, and you kind of get the picture and see the history of, of the people uh, and their relationship with God. So that's a great place to start. And then a follow-up to that one, which is here. I'll find it. I don't know what I was talking about. Yeah, it's fine. Um, is uh, Scott Hahn's um, A Father Who Keeps His Promises. And that one is on the bottom of the first page, about four from the bottom. What that book does so well, and we've just been doing it with our men's group, is it takes kind of what we just talked about, the Bible timeline, and puts it in the context of covenant. So it starts with the covenant of, with Adam, okay? With a couple, Adam and Eve, right? And then it goes through from there. It goes on to Noah, to Abraham, and then on to Moses, and then David. Jesus. Okay. And what it does is it, it helps us better understand this father, okay, who makes these covenants with these people who constantly disobey, right? And constantly, <laughs> constantly leave the covenant, and then he sends another prophet or another figure and makes a new covenant. But this covenant keeps growing. It starts off with a couple, and then it becomes you know, family with Noah, and then it becomes tribes and nations, and then ultimately to the kingdom, the Catholic Church, okay, with Jesus. Um, through the apostles, okay. So uh, what it does is it helps us get a real insight into a father. And, and the line I looked in the book was, is that uh, the father is a father who loves us unconditionally, you know, no question about that. But he also loves us in a challenging way. 
right? So as a parent, the line I like is, he loves us too much to leave us stay where we are. He loves us too much to, to leave us where we are because he creates, just like Thomas Merton says, he creates this person, he wants to be, he calls him something great, and then he leaves us too much to just leave us kind of in an immature position, right? And he kind of challenges us, just like a parent does, to have their children grow up, be educated, mature, right? And be all they can be, you know? So there's this balance between the unconditional love of the Father and then his challenging ways to, to call us to be more than he created us to be, but to call us to something greater. Right? So he does a great job in the book of kind of explaining that, how Father and Father keeps his promises, but calls his children to greater covenant, covenant of love. Um, another book that I know I've talked to you all about uh, before, um, but a great insight into the gospel, I think, is The Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Nell. And in this book, you know, we have your three characters. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Um, I know, I'm sorry, not Father. The Father is Father. Father and two sons. And, and so uh -huh. we, know, we know the story, right? Everybody knows the parable. But what Henry now does is he uses the painting by Rembrandt. And he really takes a look at, well, who is this younger son? You know, who is this older brother? And who is his father? And what's so amazing in this, in this parable is you get this insight into God's love and mercy, right? Because the father, he is in a really bad place, right? Because he's got a kid who says, Dad, you're not dying fast enough. He says, you're not going to die fast enough for me. Give me, my, give me the stuff that's due to me, and I'm out of here. And that's what he does, right? He gives him the stuff, and the kid leaves. Wow. And then the father is looking for him in the distance every day. And then one day, he sees him coming back, right? And when he takes him back, he does it in an extravagant way, right? He runs out to him, he puts the sandals on his feet and the ring on his finger and the robe and the fatted calf, and everything is great, right? No, because you got an older brother who's going, wait a minute now. <laughs> right? And the older brother can be us too, right? We can be the younger brother who leaves and returns, but we can also be that older brother who looks on others, like today in the gospel, right? Those people who worked all day were looking at those other people going, wait a minute, I worked all day. And those people that came in at five o'clock got the same deal. Who did they grumble against? They didn't grumble against the people who worked one hour. Who did they grumble against? The landowner, right? Well, who is the older brother grumbling against? Dad. He's not mad at the little brother. He might be irritated, but he's not. He's mad at Dad because, Dad, who are you? What is with you, Dad? I mean, this kid wanted you to be dead. You couldn't die fast enough. You gave him all the stuff. And now he's back, and you're doing what? Giving him the fatted calf and it's at a party and all What? So he looks at God's mercy and love and says, Who are you? Time out. Who are you? This isn't right. And how many of us sat there today and maybe in the church going, Wait a minute, that wasn't right. <laughs> we could have got more, right? Maybe a few of us were there, right? Thinking the way we think, not the way God thinks, right? But it's just such a beautiful story of how that father who loves both his children, tells his older son, all I have is yours, right? Wants him back to be found, right? Not lost. And yet the older brother just can't quite deal with it. He's very resentful. But the hardest thing is he just can't kind of, kind of comprehend who is this God who forgives? <coughs> what? that younger brother did. Looking kind of with disdain on his father. Like, I'm not going to go to that party. He disrespects his father and doesn't do it. So it's a, it's a, it kind of makes us examine, who am I? Am I like that younger son? Am I more like that older son sometimes? Or am I like that father who really does want to embrace and bring unity and love? So it's a real challenge for us. Okay. So that's just uh, on the words on the Eucharist side. We've got some great resources. And I know I've been talking to you before, so I won't go through all the details on this one because I know you remember this one. Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist was the mm -hmm. book by Brand Petrie. Many of you have done this either class or that. But this is a great book just to kind of help us better understand that we, in fact, being Catholic, have Jewish roots, right? And, and the Eucharist, which is our central the source and summit, right? The source and summit of our faith, the Eucharist, that's the greatest of all sacraments. It really comes out of its Jewish roots, right? And so you've got uh, the foundation really begins with the Passover meal, right? The lamb of sacrifice. And of course, Jesus becomes that lamb 
we must eat, right? Just like they had to eat Passover lamb. And it does a great job of really grounding, in a sense, the Eucharist back in the um, Jewish roots. Or Jewish roots right? so, so this is a great book to help people understand why we believe what we believe about the Eucharist. And then another study on the Eucharist that I think is, is a wonderful one, too, um, is Bishop Barron's. And he's got a couple different places. He's got it in his Catholicism book, but also in a series called Eucharist, uh, in which he really does probably the best job I know of of explaining why we believe that that little piece of bread and that little drop of wine, as Father Michael says so well, can become the body and blood and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. How can that happen? You know? He just does a beautiful job, beautiful job of explaining that we've got a sacrifice at the Mass, right? We're represented at, at the crucifixion as the once, once for all sacrifice. And then we're also invited to that meal, as Jesus invited us to the meal at the Last Supper, right? The offering of himself as the lamb, right? The sacrifice that we partake of at Mass. And so he just does a beautiful job of explaining how this comes about. And, you know, as Catholics, we get these questions all the time. Do you really believe, you know, that that isn't wine anymore? Do you really believe that isn't, you know, and so on? And, they, and people look at you like, you're crazy. Cool. It's, it's wafers. It's not real, you know. So how do we respond to that? And so he does a great job of explaining the power of God's word, right? The God creates through His word from the very beginning, and how Jesus, when He comes on the scene, does things with His words. When He when He talks to the paralytic, right? He says, "Your sins are forgiven." Who can do that but God? But through God's power, that can happen. And then to evidence that, He says to the man. To show that I have the authority to do this, forgive sins, pick up your mat, rise, and go home. And the guy rises, right? And he says to the little girl, little girl, to Luther Kuhn, right? Rise. And he says to Lazarus, from the dead, from the dead, Lazarus, come out. So he just doesn't have to even touch people, just his power of his word, right? And so what Bishop Aaron developed very beautifully is the power of God's word when the priests speak Jesus' words at Mass. This is my body. Makes it right, his body. So Jesus' words have power. They affect what they say. Okay? And he has that great line in there. What, what Jesus says is. When Jesus says it, it is. Period. Because he's God. Right? And so when the priests say Jesus' words, it does have that power. It's not the priest that has the power. It's Jesus that has the power to change simple elements of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And he does it through this idea of appearance and reality. It appears to be something, but we know the reality is different. I don't know all the details, but just does a great job of, of giving us sort of what I would call ammunition to defend ourselves a little bit, you know, because people ask these questions and we say, oh, it's my faith, it's what I believe. But as you, as you learn the Jewish roots and how this is all built up in the Old Testament and Jesus fulfills it, um, and then you, you listen to Bishop Aaron, and he gives you good ways to express more tangibly why we believe that God's word has such power. And that through this power that he provided to his apostles and then to their successors, that we believe that those words continue to have power today. So, a, a wonderful book on the Eucharist. Um, okay, so beyond that, Let's talk a little bit about what I talked about earlier, which was kind of formation. Okay, so what we're really called to, in a sense, this idea of true self, is, is a way to sort of take who I am and be recreated as a new creation in Christ, right? So what, what, what are some really good books for transformation? Well, this is one right away. I mean, this book had, the C.S. Lewis book, on Your Christianity, really challenges us to become sons of God, not just the human being but to move beyond that and enter into this Trinitarian life. So that's one I'd recommend for sure uh, to think about. Another book that's kind of fun, um, that I, I just, we just did you know, a, couple, a couple different classes here, is, a, is another book by um, the author of this called Crossroads. And it's about a guy who's down, uh, just a downright scoundrel, okay? And then he, through um, being in a coma, is, is able to come out of his coma, so to speak, his body's still in a coma, but his spirit isn't. And he begins to inhabit different people. It's really kind of a neat story. And whenever he touches people, he goes into somebody else. 
So he starts off with this young boy with, with uh, Down syndrome. And then he goes into his mom and then other characters. And what's so neat about it is this, this gentleman's name is Anthony Spencer. And, and Anthony goes through this transformation of being the scoundrel to this pe person who begins to love people. Because he encounters the Holy Spirit. And then he encounters Jesus. Eventually the Father, but he doesn't quite know who the Father is until later. Um, but it's a great book about this personal journey of transformation of someone who was stuck kind of in, in their worldly ways and then let go mm -hmm. of all those walls and facades and all those things they built as his defenses and <coughs> let go and embraced um, the life of the Trinity. So a great read um, and a lot of fun. Just a good book. Okay, now I have to talk about Matthew Kelly, you know, because I love Matthew Kelly too. So I love, I love hate relationship with Matthew Kelly. All right? But he, gives, he, gave me, he gave me kind of a secret, though. The big, you know, Merck got me started, but, but I, I came along this, this line, and I just thought it was the best line uh, of the book, We Discover Jesus, when he asked, what do you think Jesus wants for you? Nobody ever asked me that. I know what God wants from me, but what does he want for me? I didn't know. I guess, uh, a kid's answer would be, be good, uh, be good so that you could be in heaven. Something like that, right? Well, here's what his answer was. What do you think Jesus wants? And he said, he wants to share his joy with us so our joy may be complete. That's what he says. Right? He says in uh, John uh, 15, verse 11, I have told you this so my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. And then he went on to talk about this complete joy. and Only God can give you this joy that you want. It's like, okay, so God wants me to be filled with joy. Well, what does that exactly mean? Well, then I read this other darn book called Resisting Happiness. And I'll just rename it Resisting Joy. Okay? I wish you would have used it that way, but maybe people don't understand joy as much as they understand happiness. So here's, how, here's where he got me. He, he says, we, we resist what we know will bring us joy. And he says it like this. I have been battling resistance my whole life. What is resistance? He defines it this way. It's that sluggish feeling of not wanting to do something you know is good for you. Not wanting to do something I know is good for me. The inclination to do something I know is not good for me. The inclination to do that. And it's everything in between. And the desire and tendency to delay something you should be doing right now. Well, I read those lines and I thought of St. Paul in Romans, right? Why do I do the evil I know I shouldn't do instead of the good I know I should do? And that's St. Paul saying that, right? The last book he writes, Romans. So it's an advanced thing. And Matthew Kelly's tackling it right in the first page of this book, saying, why do we do this? Why do we resist the things we know are good for us? And why do we do the evil we know we shouldn't do? And why are we so sort of slothful, right? Why do we procrastinate? Why don't we do the things at the moment? So I started to go in deeper into this book, and and it just, just kicked my butt because every time I read something, I would just go, oh, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. And it would be things like this, you know. Do I know exercise is good for me? Well, absolutely. <laughs> Given the choice to exercise or not, what do you think I want to do? <laughs> not. <laughs> I know this food is bad for me. Given the choice to eat it or not, what do I want to do? Eat it. Eat it. <laughs> okay, alcohol. I know I shouldn't have that third drink, but you know if you like, but. Oh, what the heck. And so on. I wake up next time with a headache, right? We do these things, and we procrastinate, you know? I know I need to get something done that's nagging at me, and then well, what do I do? I just let it continue to nag at me instead of just taking care of it. And then after it takes a whole ten minutes to do it, I go, why didn't I just do that? I've been thinking about this for a week. It took me ten minutes. How many of us do that stuff? We do it all the time. So I was on the beach reading this darn book by myself, because I go out there early before the, the family, and every day, I'd read like three, four meditations, and I would just be like, oh, I love you, but I hate you, Matthew Kelly. <laughs> but again, a great read, because what it did was it just kept saying, why, why don't you do the things that you know will bring you joy? How stupid to not do those things, you know? So, I'm working at it. I'm a brag, I'm just telling you. So, after my trip, came back, Planet Fitness, I missed one day since August 29th. Now, I'm not showing it very well. I still got too much here and not enough muscle. But, I'm going. 
And when I get up in the morning, what I learned was, and he says it very well, don't lose that first battle. Win that first battle. Start with prayer. Start with God. Good morning, God. However you do that, five minutes, ten minutes, scripture, a prayer you read, just a conversation, whatever. But begin to win those battles every day. And when, you, when, you, when you're on that elliptical, and you say, I'm doing 30 minutes today, and after about 12 minutes, you're going, no, I can't do 30 minutes. <laughs> and then you're trying to negotiate with yourself. Maybe I can do 20. Oh, 15 sounds better. <laughs> and by the time you're, it's 13, well, maybe I should stop. You know, you're, you're, it's just, and I'm kind of always, one more minute. You can get to 15. You can get to 18. You can get, and then it's just this fight, you know? And it's no different when I'm lifting a weight. I do eight reps. When I'm about five, I'm going, oh, maybe I don't know if I can make that. Oh, I'm going to get one more. Okay, one more. Come on. You can do it. You know? And you say, why, why are you into this craziness? You know, it sounds crazy. Like, why are you battling this, right? But I made a commitment to my wife to lose weight and to be healthier after her brother died. And ever since then, I've gained weight. And, <laughs> and I had to ask myself this big question, which is, do I love my wife more? Right? Do I love my wife more than bad food and being lazy and all those kind of things? And I knew the answer, duh, but yet I wasn't putting it into practice. You know? Now, have I done everything perfectly? Obviously not. But it's one journey, that one step on that journey at a time, right? And so you make those movements and you just battle that resistance and it happens all day long. Preparing for the next class. Am I ready for it? Do I have my stuff ready? Am I have my thoughts organized? Or am I just going to wing it? No, I'm not going to wing it. Just get ready. You know, get, so it's every moment, pretty much of every day, saying, you know, don't fight it. Go with it. And so there's some great, great stories in here about dedicating yourself one hour at a time to God, you know, just one hour a day. You know, maybe you like to garden or you like to do something. Just jet, mow the grass. Dedicate that hour to someone you love and that you ask God to um, take special care of them and they feel your presence today or something like that. All sorts of different stories in these books um, that are just great. And so it really, it really challenged me, which I said, like, I have this love hate relationship. And every time I open this book, I just cringe because I, I'm going to get nailed. But I have to say that this one book, honestly, has made more of a difference in the actual activity than anything else I've done. Because other things I can tend to do, I learn something, but it doesn't mean I did something about it. This one kind of just poked at me enough to say, are you going to keep resisting <laughs> happiness, resisting joy, keep doing the stuff you're doing, or are you going to embrace it? So it's still a journey. Okay. Um, so that, that was a good one. Um, another little book, and I've done a talk on this one too, find it here, but it's still a great little book, uh, just if you want a place to start. Uh, it's called Reaching Jesus, Five Steps to a Full Life. And this book is about this idea of dying to self and rising to Christ, so kind of from the beginning theme. But it doesn't, in a decision, become a Christian, um, a disciple, a follower, and then prophet, priest, and king. And so it's just real practical, simple, easy read to say, what kind of things can I do more practically to reach Jesus? How do I really follow Christ? And like I said, it's, it's, it's a much more practical kind of approach. How we pray, how we read scripture, how we witness to God's word by, a, by a prop, being a prophet, how we sacrifice like a priest, even though we're not ordained, um, how we live as stewards of God's kingdom. So he just does a great job. It's like I said, a nice little read. Um, so the one I wanted to kind of close with before you have time for a few questions, I hope, is a couple things about evangelization. Like I said, I've done talks on these already, so I'm going to go into a little more detail. But Matthew Kelly has a whole section on evangelization. It's one of the four signs of a dynamic Catholic. That basically says, you got to share your faith, folks. You know, don't keep it to yourself. And he says, the best way to do this, in a sense, which I like, is do it simply. You know, buy books, buy DVDs, send emails, but constantly be providing, you know, invitations to people. Say, hey, I, I, I read this, or I looked at this, or I watched this, and it was great. You know? Yesterday we had kind of a fun um, thing at... Uh, Deacon formation, it was about as dry as could be. We were learning how to do better listening. <laughs> and I was a very unwilling listener to how to improve my listening. I was. I've been, I've been taught that stuff since I was in college, right? How to be empathic, active, 
how to re reflect back content and feelings when you're and things and I didn't all that stuff. You know? So I'm gonna go, oh, this is I'm dying. And I was. <laughs> I'm I'm the unwilling participant today in the class, yeah. So I had to lighten it up. So they were talking about how men, in particular, you know, this is Deacons that we're talking to. Always when, when people come to him, what's, what's, what does a man want to do when someone comes to him with a problem? Fix it. Fix it. Fix it. See, they didn't have to think about it. You just knew the answer, right? So there's this great um, YouTube. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you want to look this thing up. It's called, It's Not About the Nail. <laughs> it's Not About the Nail. Okay. Anybody familiar with this one? Okay. So I'll just tell you real quick what it is and why it was so perfect. It's about this woman who's having this conversation with her husband and she just wants him to listen. But he wants to fix it. And she starts off in the video, you see part of her face, and she starts off in the video explaining that she's got this pain. And it just seems like it's right here all the time. And then when the camera widens, you see she's actually got a nail in her hand. <laughs> and her husband is looking at her saying, if you just would take the nail out of your head, and then she says, stop doing that! You're always trying to fix my problems. I just want you to listen. Well, no, I don't think that is your problem. I think the problem is you have a nail on your head. He goes, oh, yes. And at the very end of this little minute and a half thing, she finally gets the point across, and he said, that sounds really hard. <laughs> He's not trying to solve it. He's just listening. And she goes, thank you. But it was just hilarious. And all the guys are cracking up. I was like, thank you. One good thing of the day. And because that's the way days are sometimes, you know. They're just like, you know, going, I'm going to die through this thing, you know. But you go through it. And what I learned was kind of comical in a way, is that even though we kind of know the skills, it, was, it kind of reminded me of really listening deeply, you know, really trying as best we can to get to where the other person is, and just to not try to solve the problem. Just to listen first, try to share back what they share with you, try to understand their feelings, express your sorrow, express it. These are not 